What's good, everybody? Episode 36 of the Slip Away Podcast coming right at you. My guest today is former number one ranked super middleweight Brandon Flawless Gonzalez. I really enjoyed my conversation with him. He was my first guest. And to be honest with you, I don't know if, if I could have had a better first guest. He was a really great guy to talk to. I gained a lot of different insight on a lot of different topics. And I think that, you know, me and him had a really cool conversation and covered a lot of ground. And it was just a pleasure to talk to him, man. So I hope that you guys enjoy. Yeah, I'm just really excited to talk to you, bro. This is really cool. Yeah. You took the time for this, man. I really appreciate. Yeah, no worries. Were you in uh, Rhode Island? Nah, I'm in uh, I'm in New Jersey. New Jersey, okay. Yeah, I knew hey. the accent was kind of strong. <laughs> I get that sometimes, especially yeah. when I'm talking to uh, guys in California. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're yeah. in Sacramento, right? Yeah, Northern California. So tell me a little bit about your gym. I've seen on your Instagram that you you have your own gym and you do all your tutorials out of there, right? Yeah, yeah. We opened up uh, about six years ago. We're on our six years of business. Uh, three different uh, gyms that we've opened up. We've expanded each time. And really, it's for everybody. It's for amateur boxers, um, adults, people within the community to come for fitness. Um, the main, I think the main heartbeat of our gym is our youth program, though. We have uh, Flows for Youth, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded, you know, in 2010. And that's really the, the, you know, the meat and potatoes of the boxing gym. So we have a really strong youth program. We're pretty much almost at capacity with, uh, you know, the whole COVID going on right now. So all of our kids are, you know, we're waitlisted. We, we, are, we run uh, two sessions per day. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. We've got a great staff building a great community over these last few years. And we've made, had a lot of social impact as well. Yeah, talk to me a little bit more about that, because I know at least personally in like the gym that I trained that everybody's going through hardships with this time. Like, how are you guys doing? How are the kids? And you know what I'm saying? I know if you're not sometimes if you're not Canelo Alvarez, you know, something like this is very impactful, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. I think if you're a small business in general, of course, you're impacted in a negative way due to uh, COVID. So without a doubt, we don't we're not anything special. We fall under that uh, category as well. Um, with the youth, I think it's it's been very helpful because all the other sports are, are closed down or they stop. They're just now starting to open back up over here. So they really need an outlet. They're at home. They're on their laptops. They're 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 missing that social component of school, which is huge. So parents, you know, have thanked us for uh, keeping our youth program going um, as limited as it is. Uh, I think it's been really helpful towards the youth and just people in general. People need yep. that release. They need that, uh, you know, they need that part of their life that's, uh, you know, been taken away from it, rightfully so, you know, it's hard, uh, you know, we want to be safe, we want to uh, adhere to the, uh, you know, demands that have been put on us through the county, but at the same time, uh, part of living, part of going on is that social part, is that fitness, is the, you know, that part of your life that is, it's always been there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so true, man, I, I, I think about, you know, um, how important it is just on a life level to be able to get in the gym, especially for young people, you know what I mean? And be able to uh, be able to get out their wiggles, man. And, and, and not having that right now is, is, is tricky. So it's right, obviously right. it's cool that, you know, for guys like you that are able to provide some of that right now. Right. Right. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm like, I I've actually, you know, as a growing up and being, you know, a little younger, I watched some of your career and I always really enjoyed it. I've been a fan oh. for quite a few years and I was just, I'm wondering a little bit, if you could just talk to me a little bit about like what the HBO boxing experience is like, you know, my, uh, you know, growing up, like that's like the prestige boxing kind of, you yeah. know what I mean? And, um, I don't know that that, if there's like a equivalent to that at the moment, so I'm, I'm curious for someone that's had that experience, like, what is that like? Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, even as a young fighter, uh, it was always HBO, man. I always wanted to fight yeah. on HBO, HBO Championship Boxing, HBO Boxing After Dark. 
uh, yeah, that was a big, that was a big deal for me. Uh, you know, Michael Buffer calling out your name, talking to Jim Lampley and all those guys, you know, those are, those are something I think every prospect or every, even amateur boxer you wanted to do is fighting. Cause that was kind of like the pinnacle of, of boxing, you know, HBO, HBO pay-per-view. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, one thing I'll tell you about this experience, uh, I met when I met Peter Nelson, I tell his people, I tell people this story all the time. When I met Peter Nelson, he was doing, he was the uh, exec of HBO sports at the time. I tell everybody he has the softest hands I've ever shook ever out of anybody, male or female. Uh, he has the softest hands. And that's one thing that I always remember about, you know, my experience fight on HBO. That's wild. That's really funny, yeah. man. That was a, uh, and that was a great fight too, man. I mean, that really was a great fight. The guy was the the South African guy who stays in. Yeah, yeah, who dies in. Uh, yeah, I think I was a four and a half one underdog going into that fight. Uh, you know, it was a good experience. You know, it was a good experience. My first ten rounder. You know, I never had anything easy in my career. My first ten rounder was against a you know a top five ranked opponent in the world. Um, you know, so it was it was it was good, man. Yeah. What was your feeling during the fight? Because obviously, you know, to the naked eye, like I thought it was relatively obvious that you won like the first six yeah. rounds. You know what I mean? But obviously it's a close fight. He's a good yeah. fighter. You know, what's your feeling during the fight? Like, are you feeling confident? Like I'm I'm it, doing what I want to do right now? You know, I, I didn't feel like there was too many rounds where he bested me because even when he had his moments, I would come back immediately with it. Even yep. if there was like a little bit of, uh, you know, from what I remember is, you know, some of the rounds later in the fight, there was less activity, but even when he would get off and have his moments, I would immediately come right back. And that's something, you know, that we've worked on obviously in sparring or fighting. If someone, you know, tries to take that momentum from you, you want to get it right back. And I think we did that in almost every, every case that I can remember uh, so yeah, I felt confident that I won the fight, but again, it's fight game, man. You never know. Uh, and you know, they ended up calling it a draw, but you know, it is what it is. What is, I guess I'm curious. I've always wondered, you know, from a fighter's perspective, like being, you know, I've been watching boxing for years and I'm always so surprised at how often the decisions are just really shaky. Like, what do yeah. you, what do you think that is? Is there, are there fighters that you know, there's interest over here or whatever, or is it just that sometimes you're just watching something different and you can't help it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a combination of everything, right? I think, you know, the, per the judges have a certain perspective that we don't see on TV. So that could obviously be different. Um, right. And then you gotta, you got it's they're humans, you know what I mean? So yeah. some of them like certain types of styles than others, right? Some people like that aggressive come forward, bringing the action to you. And some got some judges may like the, the, the sweet science of it. So I think that's definitely a factor. Human emotion and feeling is definitely a factor in how they judge. And then again, you know, if Canelo loses a fight, there's a lot of people that miss out on millions and millions of dollars. So I think there's some type of understanding in there as well as, you know, uh, you know, there, I think there's an understanding of how to, uh, you know, each fight. It's so true, man. And I thought, to be honest with you, I thought the uh, the Broner fight this past weekend was like a perfect example of that, where, I, you know, I just I don't know if you watch that fight, but to, in my opinion, it was just he wasn't really letting his hands go. And this guy was kind of just outworking him. And yeah, and the, they read the cards and it's like nine, three, eight, four. It's like, where is this coming from? You know, yeah. and, and, you know, that, and that's I didn't see that fight, but I asked a lot of different people and some people said Broner won easy. Some people said it was a competitive fight. And some people thought the other guy won. It, it just, in, in yeah. you know, in that case, again, it's just, uh, you know, what you're looking for. So you got to think some right. people don't like Broner, so they want to see him lose. So that may be a factor in how they view the fight as well. It's very true. I, I, I guess for me, I was disappointed because I, I kind of like him. You know, I like watching yeah. his fights. He's, he has entertaining fights. So it's, you know, you want to see somebody fulfill that potential. But going back to the, the HBO fight, I wanted to ask you for a sec about, um, about, working with Virgil Hunter because yeah. he's always been one of my favorite guys to watch train guys. Everybody right. has a different approach, you know, like right. the guys like, a, um, you know, like a Joel Diaz who's very loud and can kind of yeah. like in your face, but Virgil yeah. is very, um, he's very calm and precise. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, what is it like going back to the corner and having that kind of voice? Well, he has his moments, right? I think he's a little bit, I think he's what he needs to be in that moment. Um, 
you know, his, 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 I've known Virgil and Andre for a long time. Uh, even when I was uh, early in my amateur career, I used to box with Andre all the way from, you know, the Olympics to, you know, late in both of our pro careers. So I've, I've had that relationship with them a while. His style of teaching always worked well with how I, how I receive information. So right. I thought that was, a, that was a really good, uh, we were just a really good relationship as far as trainer fighter goes. So yeah, he's uh, he's very articulate. He's, he, he explains stuff, and he's the type of coach that you want to 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 build a strategy for a fight. And as far as executing it, because he breaks everything down in details, explains you when, why, and where. And I've adopted a lot of my coaching style from him, and the way I teach my fighters as well. So uh, yeah, Virgil's an excellent coach, uh, without a doubt. I think the proof is there. You know, he's one of the few trainers that have created an Olympic medalist all the way to a world champion. So um, I think that right there. Uh, proves that you know how how good of a trainer he is is he somebody that you worked with from the beginning because I remember in one of the telecasts they had mentioned that you had started a little bit later like is he somebody that was kind of one of your early trainers no no I just always boxed with Andre uh, because you know he's in Oakland I was in Sacramento so I'd always boxed with Andre uh, throughout different parts of my career and then I finally started with training with uh, Virgil probably maybe like five years before uh, my last fight. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's cool, man. That's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I was wondering, you know, did you start at, as a teenager? Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't start actually boxing until I was 18. Yeah. That's wild, man. I'm, I've yeah. always wondered from, so, cause it's hard to, you know, pe most people, if they start that late, they do not get to the level that you've been to. Like, what's your take on that? Is does everyone just kind of have a different timeline? You know, it, it, it's yeah everybody every individual is different I think definitely to it gives you a lot better chance to be successful starting at a, at a young young age because yeah. you develop such uh you know a lot of habits uh your body um the way you the way you develop you know running miles as a kid you know what I mean so all that helps but with me it was like I started at 18 by the time I was 19 I was already ranked number one in the country as a, as an amateur. So I just did, you know, I, I said, you know what, I'm years behind. So I broke it down into hours. So how can I outwork these same guys by yeah. putting in more hours per day, man. And, you know, it was, it, it, it became what it was a lot of sacrifice and um, working out every day, you know, four or five, six hours a day, different sessions, whether it was uh, running, boxing, watching film, I knew uh, I knew the predicament I was in and, uh, you know, I thought that would give me my best chance of being successful was just putting in hours and hours every day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also, too, there's um, for guys that start super young, you could there's a, a very specific, you know, a technique that they have. There's a very specific look to them. Whereas yeah. with guys that start a little later, their timing is like your timing is really difficult to handle because yeah. it's not completely standard like it's sure. it, it's very effective and it looks right. great but it's it's not standard so somebody like right. stays in it like you know it throws right. in for a right. loop because you're hitting them with shit right. he's like, whoa you know what i mean yeah and you can tell not only can you tell the difference between uh you know like a c-level fighter and a and a world-class fighter you can tell the difference but you could tell the difference between someone who had hundreds of amateur fights versus a guy that came a little bit later to the game you know what i mean not to say you can't be successful uh, you know, there's guys out there, but definitely, uh, you know, in this in this game, uh, timing, you know, the amount of time that you put in and then, uh, you know, your experience definitely matters. Yeah. In, in kind of segueing out of experience, you know, I remember seeing like some of the Friday night fight fights, you know what I mean? And yeah. you were fighting some pretty rugged, uh, some pretty rugged dudes, man. Like there was, you know, there was a. Uh, the guys, I think his name was Aussie Duran. I remember there was a, there was a, uh, I think one guy's name was Darnell Boone and he yeah. had like Andre and all these other guys. Like what's the, is that like an important stage to be able to fight kind of rugged guys that have that experience? Yeah. I mean, there's always a certain way to develop a fighter and you definitely want to and face those guys, you know, whether you do it in the gym, cause you can't face tough fighters in the gym as well as in the fight, but you want guys that are going to get like Darnell Boone, man. It's probably one of my toughest fights to date. Right. That guy hit me with a body shot so hard. I, you know, I still remember to this day, it's probably the hardest I've ever been hit was by Darnell Boone. 
uh, yeah, he hit me with a body shot, man. And it was, that was the, really the first time that I'd really been hit that hard. And, uh, you know, I fought him with, uh, I think I had maybe like six or eight fights. And he was a guy that was, you know, fighting all the all the best prospects on on short notice. Right. And uh, he, you know, he we they gave him like a two month notice out. And you know, I didn't, I did, I was young, so I didn't, I didn't really know who he was at the time. You know, I didn't watch film. I didn't really do a lot of research on fighters I was fighting. All I was basing him off his record, and he had like a five hundred record. But he had like 30, 40 fights. I don't remember. And I was like, man, who is it? Like, why do you guys? I kept at, I was being promoted by Terry and Tommy Lane, the Lane's brothers. And I was like, who, who is this guy? Uh, you know, you guys keep saying he's going to be a tough fight for me, but he's got like a 500 record. Right. And uh, you know, when we got in the ring, I, uh, I got, I got excited because I had heard him in the first round and I thought I was going to knock him out in the first round and being the crafty veteran that he was, he survived. Right. And then, uh, yeah, I think in the third or fourth round, his trainer kept yelling, man, put it down in the hole, put it down in the hole. And I, you know, I didn't, I, I knew what it was, but I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't know he wasn't, tra- he wasn't doing it. And then he finally right. did. He hit me right in the solar plex, man. And that was probably the hardest that I've ever been hit in my whole career. But, you know, I ended up winning the fight. No problem. It was a unanimous decision, but it was a tough fight is what I'm trying to get to. And you definitely need those uh, to prove to yourself, to prove to everybody else, you know, that you can come out of a, a you know, a tough, rugged situation like that. Yeah. And it's funny, like you often hear fighters talk about those opponents and those development fights and like think yeah. of this is their hardest fights. I've seen like multiple interviews with Mayweather where he says, yeah. you know, Augustus is my hardest fight. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like you that, that's an experience you never had somebody right. that that's right. seen that many different things. You right. know, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Those fights, those fights are always interesting to me and those fighters are always interesting to me. Um I'm also curious too, man, you know, I, the, the fight against the Gale, you know, that was in front of like 80, I don't even know what the number is at that stadium at Wembley. It's so many fucking people. Like, what is yeah, it like? I That's like a was, very uh, thin air that very few people get to breathe in. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that was another great experience The people in uh, England are incredible, uh, incredible, huge fight fans. And yeah, that was, a, that was, it was a great experience, you know, 80,000. I think was the number was sold out Wembley stadium, huge event, uh, you know, yeah. Pay-per-view. So, you know, that's, is that's probably, it's probably about as big as it gets. That was probably one of the largest crowds in boxing, uh, you know, maybe since uh, when Chavez fought, um, uh, what's his name? Pernell Whitaker. You know, I think they right. had a hundred thousand at the Aladome and I think, you know, Klitschko did some 50, 60 thousands, but 80,000, man, it was huge. But, you know, it's 80,000 or, or a thousand people it still felt the same to me. Right. You know, when you're, when you're going to the ring, um, I liked it because it was outside. That was, uh, that was probably, you know, you feel, I just always felt comfortable fighting outside. I liked fighting outside. So right. yeah, it was definitely a great experience. Are you hearing all of it? Are you, are you right here? Yeah. I, I, you're pretty much locked in, man. You know, you're not, you, you know, I, I, at, at, at that point in my career, like I didn't, it, that stuff didn't really get to me like it did early on. You know what I mean? Right. It, 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 it didn't. Yeah. I guess, but you know, by the time you get to that point, it's something you've been preparing for. It, yeah. Maybe this is a stupid question. Are you retired? Yeah, I'm done, man. You know, I'm done uh, with the asterisk mark next to it. What's the asterisk? Uh, I, 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 I'm, I got a video coming out where I'm going to address it. So okay. I can't, I can't give you the exclusive on this one. Okay. All right. Yeah, but I'm done. I'm retired as of right now. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's understandable. Well, do you got do you have any young guys that you're like super excited about right now? Yeah, yeah. You know, I do. I got a couple guys that I, I don't work with a lot of fighters, man. When I transitioned into coaching, uh, again, like I talked about with Virgil, my 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 whole thing was uh programming versus reprogramming. And what I mean by that is I wanted to start all of my fighters from scratch. So, like I said, we have a really strong youth program. Um, so a lot of the kids that I train, I started from the, you know, the first time they put on a pair of boxing gloves was with, with me. And that was really the, uh, you know, the fulfillment that I found in coaching and mentoring uh, was kids. Along the way, a couple of guys came to me, uh, you know, what I got a kid now, he's four and O's, Will Villa, he's a 126, 130 pounder. He's, uh, you know, he's doing pretty well. He's a prospect that I've been working with for a few years, but I knew him since he was eight years old. He used to train. When I was in amateur boxing, he was in the youth, in the, in the juniors. 
And so he had came to me and asked me and I thought I could help him out. So I trained him. And then I got a kid uh, who's originally from Russia. He's out here now. He's been out here for a few years. He's uh, he's a, he's probably going to be a light heavyweight when we decide to turn him professional. Uh, you know, he's we're good. He had a strong amateur background. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about him. A couple of guys. And then I got a lot of guys in my gym. I don't necessarily train them, but uh, they have other coaches. But, you know, they they spar together and it's really good work. So they help each other develop. But yeah, for the most part, I'm excited about the kids. When we get back to the amateur boxing circuit, we're going to be able to get them and start, uh, you know, keeping them busy. Yeah. Are there, there's, is there any sort of amateur competition going on right now? Nothing. Or? Yeah, nothing. Okay. There's no sparring, nothing. It's interesting. Cause I've seen, I, I, I used to coach, so I get some of the emails about, you know, what yeah. I say, boxing, whatever. And in New Jersey, it seems like kind of a gray area for competition. To be honest with you, I'm not really sure. I feel like there probably is, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. wink, wink. but yeah. uh, as far as I know, it's, you know, and that's what's crazy is it's like, that's the time where guys really need that development. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that experience. It's like such a, this is like a, 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 a very unfortunate time to be a young fighter, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is tough, man. And even though amateur boxing isn't the same uh, as it was maybe five, 10 years ago, I still think it's very important for fighters. It's a great development stage for them. Um, so I'm still high on amateur boxing yeah. and, and the competition, the traveling and everything that comes with, um, you know, doing the amateur. So, yeah, I'm one of those coaches that definitely like to like my guys to get a lot of amateur boxing fights. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, it really is important. Um, as far as like some of the younger guys, I was I'm wondering you know, as, as a fighter yourself, they talk about like the, the four Kings at lightweight, right? Yeah. The Ryan Garcia, yeah. Hank Davis, Devin Haney. And um, of course, now I'm going to forget the fourth one. Uh, uh, think- Emma Lopez, of yeah, course. Yeah, she's a female, yeah. How do you look at those four guys and who do you think is maybe going to, you know, rise to the top when it's when the dust settles? Uh, man, I think it's an exciting time to be in that, in that weight division. I think all of those guys, are uh very well very good um you know tiafimo you got to give him the the slight edges because he's you know he's beat lomachenko he's got uh, he's undisputed um and i think he's good i think he's good too i see special qualities with uh devin haney and i think ryan garcia doesn't get as much credit as he probably should um and i think that's good you know there's they, they have their own fan base you have people saying this guy will knock this guy out this guy will knock this guy out so I think it's going to be an excellent time for all four of them. I mean, and, you know, Tank is a man child, man, and he can he can really hurt you. So um, I think all four of those guys, of course, I want to see them all fight, man. You know, I want to see them all fight and hopefully we do see it. And then we can really see decide, you know, who's the true king of, uh, you know, of that division. Yeah. And that, I mean, that weight class, even beyond those guys, you still got Lomachenko, you still yeah. got guys like Linares, yeah. you know, there's, there's, you know, Shakur Stevenson. I feel like he's oh, yeah, probably going to move up sooner than yeah, later. Super talent, super talent. He's freaky, man. Like his timing is crazy to me. Every time I yeah. watch him, it just seems like he's switched on in a place that is very few people get to. Yeah. yeah. And he's getting better too. All of them are getting better, but uh, Shakur Stevenson is getting better too. <sighs> He really is. And I think like for him, he's because he's super young, too. He's like, whatever, 22, 21. Yeah, I think like he's he's just going to keep moving up weight classes and those skills are just going to carry him. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What did you did you get to watch Canelo at all yesterday? I did watch the Canelo fight. Yeah. For as long as it lasted. I I mean, I think it went as expected, man. I think it went as expected. You can't you can't. You can't complain about the fight. You know what I mean? We really can't. Uh, He fought a mandatory. So he did what he was supposed to do against him. Uh, You know, uh, that guy probably made more money than he has in his entire career. So you can't be mad at that. And then we can't complain about wanting, complain about fighters fighting once or twice a year and then turn around and complain about Canelo staying busy. Just you can't fight murderers row every fight if you're fighting four or five times a year. So, you know, big ups to Canelo because there's not a lot of champions that are doing that right now. They may say, or they may want to stay that active, but he's the one that's actually doing it. And that's not very common in this era of boxing. Right. 
No, yeah. he's he's really he's he's not shying away from anything right now, man. And it's like the the move up to fight Kovalev, I thought that was yeah. so risky. And then yeah. if he just like, I mean, it was a hard fight, but at the end of the day, like he kind of made it look easy, like yeah. one sixty to one seventy five, like it's nothing. Yeah. And the size differences in those weight classes that you know, yeah. you know, that's gigantic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the height difference and the size difference between Callum Smith and Kovalev was, you know, it was significant. So for him to, uh, you know, make that jump and, and get stoppage in both, both of them was, a uh, you know, a good fight for him. I think it was too. And I think the fact that, um, the fact that Ryan Garcia gets to, to train and be around that is like, I mean, that's a huge advantage for him. I know all the other guys have people around them, but just to be able to be in that team day in and day out, yeah, he was invaluable, you know. Oh yeah, that experience and and, and being around that definitely is. What is your? Because I, I, Ryan Garcia falls into like uh, an interesting category where there's people that you know are from that social media era, and so that's the angle that they're they're coming at it from. You know what I mean? And then I think as a boxing fan, people really like him too. But there's certain boxing purists that are like, you know, he's a social media type fighter. But I think that he's a lot more than that. You know, he can really bang and he can really, you know, I think getting up off the deck against Campbell kind of shows, you know, where, where his grit is at, you know? Yeah. I think when, I think when you peel all that back, um, you know, this is a kid that had over 200 amateur fights. Right. I think he split one and one with uh, Devin Haney in the amateurs. I think they both have wins over each other. Uh, And then he knocked out an Olympic gold medalist with uh, one, one shot. So to say he can't fight is, uh, I don't know. I think that's, I think you're just looking at it on the surface. Right. You're looking at his social media personality, which is something that I encourage all fighters to do because look at the position that it's put him in. It's put him next to Canelo. It's put him in conversation with fighting Manny Pacquiao, whether that fight was going to happen or not. Only, you know, they know, Um, but still the conversation was out there and all that is helping him promote his brand and it gives him leverage uh you know every time that he fights so i mean you know this is this is the this is the new era you know you don't you can you have direct access to your market your fan base through social media and that's something that i strongly encourage my fighters that all fighters to do is to utilize the social media platform because it's not that's going to do nothing but help you did you i i read a little bit about the Garcia and Pacquiao fight and what exactly happened. I don't know if you read about this and please tell me if you did, but I think it was going to be an exhibition with Manny and Oscar and they had passed that on to Garcia, not entirely explaining. Right. That that was going to be an exhibition like at somebody's house. Oh, really? No, I didn't read that. I read it was going on and off about exhibition with uh, Garcia. They said originally, it was going to be a fight and then they switched it back. And, you know, who knows, man, you know, we, if, it, if the fight ever gets signed and sealed, I think we'll, we'll know a little bit more, but uh, you know, the, the talk has pretty much died about the fight entirely. So yeah. I didn't hear that though. Yeah, I, I think it was Mark Kriegel or one of the ESPN guys that did a okay. peek out, you know, Oscar and Manny were going to do an exhibition of some kind, yeah. somebody's like expensive house or whatever, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, well, Oscar's Oscar's campaigning like he's uh, going to do something. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I don't know, man. I mean, I guess as far as, you know, I don't know. I, don't, I can't think of the right way to put it, but kind of the OG circuit. Yeah. You know, like, I think that he could probably do something in that. But then he's always talking like he wants to fight somebody that's really doing it right now, you know? And it's like, it's yeah, kind of I mean, two different things, man, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. And we'll see what happens. If he wants to get in with Roy than it is to get in with Canelo, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think even Roy would be a dangerous fight at this, at this point in his career, you know, he's been active. Mm -hmm. He's been staying in the ring and shit, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So there's like two different things where you have somebody like Ryan Garcia who can really, um, who can really fight and he's using social media to help promote that. And then there's like the flip side of that where you have the Paul brothers. Yeah. Who don't know really anything about boxing yeah but in a, in a weird way there's almost a place for that so like what is your what is your position on that is it do you think it's good for boxing do you think it's good for boxing that guys like that are able to put on a show and kind of bring in a new audience or is it as somebody who kind of took the the real route to do it is it like come on man like we work our ass off for this i mean what 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 is what is your definition of a real route 
I mean, but while well, you had an amateur career, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You had to fight real guys. You had to fight tough guys. You didn't have to fight Nate Robinson. You know right. what I mean? Like, you get what I'm saying? I mean, it's yeah, not, no, they're still I taking that risk. I'm not saying they're not taking that yeah. risk either because they are. Yeah. But it's absolutely. a different risk. Yeah. Uh, you know, it. like I said, the times are changing, but this is really nothing new under the sun, man. Uh, you know, there's been exhibitions like this going on around when you go back and you see uh, Muhammad Ali uh, had an exhibition with the with the Japanese um, wrestler. Right. Uh, right. You know, he, you know, he, he almost lost a leg because of the fight. Um, you know, you had Butterbean, the king of the four rounders. <laughs> um, so th- this is nothing new, man. It may be new to the younger audience and maybe, uh, you know, the younger boxing fans. But boxing, man, boxing is a hustler sport, man. And, and you know, right. everybody's trying to make a dollar. And uh, this in this situation is no different. You got Triller uh, entering the boxing game. They just won that huge uh, bid for Tia Fimo. Yeah. Uh, and this is a social media platform. So, you know, again, the, it's changing. I think um, I think uh, the Paul brothers, I I don't think they're bad for the sport. You know, I think it's uh, you know, they're bringing they're, again, they're bringing audiences, a new audience to the game. And I always look at it like um, look at the other fighters that get the opportunity. Right. So even if you have uh, a Floyd Mayweather and a, and a Logan Paul headlining a boxing, a huge boxing card. Think about the guys that are going to get that opportunity to fight on the undercard, you know. Yeah. So I always I, I I look at good the good in every situation, um, you know, in, in a situation like that. So I think it's good for boxing, man. Let's bring it on. Let's get let's get more people involved in it. And again, it goes back to fighters should be doing the same thing. Fighters, you know, the Paul brothers got into the game because of their social media platform, right? Twenty right. million followers, subscribers on YouTube, or I think something along those lines. Uh, think about the benefit that it would help a fighter with the with the background with the um, experience you know think about it what it can do for them so I try to look at the good in every situation and I thought the Mike and Roy fight was a cool example of that where those early fights were great and I had never heard of a lot of those guys and I feel like because I tuned in for that night I got exposed to these fighters that you know I wouldn't have been able to watch had I not tuned in you know Yeah, yeah I mean if you don't if you don't if you don't like something just don't watch it. Right. You know, that easy. Yeah. yeah. I agree. It's, it's, it's true. And I think, I think it absolutely has its place. And I think that, um, I think it just shows like boxing is in a good place where people want to yeah. be a part of it and they want, you know, they want to, even if they're coming to it from a different place, it's like, that's not a bad thing. It's dangerous enough. Like let's get as many eyes as possible. Yeah. You have to, you know, in order for anything, a business, uh, an organization, uh, to survive, you have to adapt, right? So, you know, you saw early in the day, or back when I was fighting, it was HBO and Showtime. You know, those guys aren't as relevant as they were before. You know, Showtime Sports is still in the game, but not, you know, it was every Saturday you were seeing a Showbox or a or an HBO After Dark. Right. Now you have The Zone, you have ESPN, you have the apps, you have Triller. The game is changing. Yep. In boxing is in order for it to survive like it has for hundreds of years, it's just evolving. So, uh, you know, again, this stuff is nothing new. I think it's just it's it's staying relevant. And, you know, that's what's, I think, uh, important for the survival of the sport and for, uh, you know, fighters to continue to get an opportunity. And by and boxing's always had that versatility i feel like it's the most versatile resilient sport there is because it can be whatever it wants to be it's not the nfl it's not the nba you know it can be it can be whatever it wants to be boxing and prostitution is one of the oldest uh you know forms of uh occupations (laughs) i've never heard a foot like that before that's interesting yeah yeah Yeah. so i mean it's it's been around a long long time man yeah that's definitely the truth bro i was uh i don't want to take too much of your time but you know before maybe we wrap it up, I'm wondering, like, what's your number one tip to young fighters right now, especially in this time? Like, what can you say to them to to help them move forward when there's a lot of stagnation? Uh, obsession, man. Obsession. Um, you know, you got to be obsessed with the sport and, and every aspect of it, you know, whether it goes from uh, running, training, watching film, uh, you know, developing uh, as a fighter, it, it you know, you have to be obsessed with it and you have to sacrifice all of those distractions. I mean, it, it's the same rules that apply in any craft. If you want to get be- better at it, if you want to be the best at it, 
you have to, you, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice and there's going to be a lot of dedication. I think if I could sum it up in one word, I would call it obsession because yeah. I think I was, I was obsessed with the sport at a certain time. You know what I mean? So that would be my advice because you have such a, athletes have a, such a small window and even fighters, you have a smaller window because of the type of, uh, you know, the type of co competition that you're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I would, you know, I would definitely, um, you know, tell them to be obsessed with the sport and, you know, and, and, and make a run and try to have as many little uh, mistakes as possible in your career. Cause I, I always treat it as, you know, just like one shot can change the whole fight, change your life. Uh, you, you know, you treat it as if you only had one shot and try to make as little mistakes as possible. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. I'm, uh, I'm really, I'm really grateful you took this time today. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Like, yeah. I'm not going to lie, bro. You're my first guest. I've never done uh, this before. Hey, man, oh, this has been great. a very cool experience. Hopefully there's many more, but remember there can only be one first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully we can do this again sometime, man. It's it's, it's really man. been a pleasure. Thanks for, you know, thanks for the invite, and you know, I look forward to it. All so, right, man. I really appreciate this, man. It's been a lot yeah, of fun. Thanks. No worries, man. Good luck to you, brother. Thank you, Brian. Take it easy, bro. Right, take care.